the kind of one of our last rounds of the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant Leadership Series. Um, I am uh, your host, Allison Daly. I don't think you can see me right now, but um, CEO of Recruiting Innovation. And today it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Katrina Kibben. Um, Katrina is a little bit of a legend in her own right. Um, I've followed her fun, interesting tweets for a long time before I somehow landed on her LinkedIn page and I was like, oh my gosh, and you're in Colorado too? Excellent. And so I just pinged her and we've chatted and she's awesome. She, um, just to give a little bit of her repertoire, she actually started out way back in recruiting in all forms, but really I was, she started being, she landed up being a managing editor for Recruiting Daily. So she's been in the writing space on the recruiting arm for a long time. You were with Ronstadt, obviously like top tier recruiting firm. She was a technical copywriter for them. And then she founded her own uh, copywriting and recruiting boutique firm of all kinds of services, Three Years Media for about 10 years now. So she is, I can let her introduce herself a little bit more, but her skill set is just helping recruiters get clarity on how to communicate with words through messages, job descriptions, how do you find the story and get people engaged with your story rather than push bullet points in their faces. Um, so yes. without further ado, it is actually it's so much my pleasure to hand the mic over to you, Katrina. Thanks for being here. Of course, of course. I don't miss opportunities to, to talk to people who are living this life because I think it's really easy as someone who's now in my own little bubble, right? I work in consulting. I'm, I'm working with a lot of different companies, but I love the time that I just get to talk to brilliant recruiters. So I'm really, really excited to be here with all of you. And, you know, I, as I was thinking about this, whenever people ask about my career story, I'm all like, this was a massive accident, right? Um, I actually, I write this letter every week and my letter tomorrow is about a question I was asked yesterday, which was, you know, what are the milestones of your career? And I realized that I've never thought of it that way. Mm, I, yes. my career was an accident, truly. Um, I mean, how many people do you know go from CMO of an HR technology company to managing editor, to technical copywriter, to CEO? But that's a weird resume, right? Mm -hmm. I even joke with people like, you know, you might be confused if you've read my resume, but what I do isn't confusing at all, at least not from my perspective, because what I realized after all those gigs, right, working with Ronstadt, working at Monster.com, doing recruiting, is that I sat with so many teams, right? Every single team could agree on one thing. Hiring is hard. And I know all of you are going to laugh at me because no, no shit, Captain, obviously. Like, thank you so much for this big reveal. But that's not what I came here to teach you by any means. What I realized is that hiring is hard because there are a million variables we do not control. We can't control if their dad is sick and they can't relocate. We can't control if their kids are about to start high school and they don't want to move, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing we can always control is how we ask, how we speak to people, how we respect other people, how we care for them, how we think of them before we ever start writing. And so I created, and then I realized, right, I'm sitting on all these teams, I never met another copywriter. Not once, not one person who specialized in writing on a recruiting team, right? And so I realized pretty quickly there was a huge business opportunity there to be the person who could teach recruiters how to write. And I have a feeling that's why I ended up here today. <laughs> yes. I mean, what a journey. And it's the same thing with like, most recruiters don't like, you don't wake up, you know, you're not a 12 year old being like, oh, I hope to be a recruiter. Like it's one of those industries where I'm always like, what's your origin story? Cause like how I call myself the accidental recruiter. I fell into this four times and then picked it three times. Like, I mean, you're, career trajectory makes so much sense. It's, I, I, how do you feel about how, where you landed now? Like what you're, what are you primarily working on now? And is that like what you want to be doing? Like, does it culminate everything? <laughs> in the, Absolutely. Yes. I didn't realize I was going through the weirdest training program ever. 
Um, so the majority of my work is writing better job postings. They are the currency of recruiting. I think every single recruiter should know how to write job postings. 100%, yes. Um, so that's usually the first project that companies do with us. And then it ends up rolling into all their copywriting. Hey, Katrina, can you work on our career site? Can you help us write our email automation? Can you help me get better outreach on our source, like get a response rates on our sourcing emails, right? Yes. It's really creating a language that's unique to that company. I call it a recruiting voice. So all, if you've ever heard of brand voice or voice guidelines at oh, a big yeah. company, same concept, except I believe that recruiters should have one that's unique to the brand and the employees. And that's, ooh, okay. There's a lot to unpack there because I imagine I know you and like you have a system and mm -hmm. you have process cool. like there's probably like a discovery phase and then you iteration and oh man what a cool creative process to be part of. And that's where the combination of being a managing editor and a technical copywriter come together because I start all of it by doing intake right so I talk to people who have the job the people who your hiring managers are always like I would multiply them if I could. Like if I could press a button of six of Benjamin, I would press that button, right? And so we talk to those people and we ask a series of questions that puts them in scenarios where they felt the way we want people to feel. One of the questions I always ask is, you know, can you tell me about the time you were most proud of your work, your team, or this company? And what that question alone is able to tell me is inherent motivation. Right? We kind of scrape off that surface level of these are our values. These are, this is our employer value proposition, right? We scrape off all that BS and corporate talk and we pull back the layer of how do people talk about this work? Mm. You know, and we do it both from, okay, I'm nerding out now. And I love I'm it. I'm, I'm writing so many notes. But, but half of it is literally text analysis where I look at the exact words they use because we know that words don't have universal language. If I asked all of you to define collaboration, every single one of you would say something different. If I, define, if I asked all of you to define driven, every single one of you would give me a different definition, right? But we all use that language so free flow as if it's not our own, as if the company doesn't have its own meaning. And so we really dive in to say, collaboration means this here then use that as a filter for the candidate experience. So we do candidate experience assessments and then we create a roadmap for them. And I always say, you know, if this was my company, right? If I was you, this is what I would do. And this is the approach that I would take because I know your people. I know their heart. I know what they care about. I know how passionate they are. I can create this filter that says, Yes, you should have a best in class career site, but let me show you what best in class for you means because they are not the same. Wait. Best in class does not mean best for you. Know that. It's best for you is the personalized version of best in class. It's your way. Because when people come to my company, a friend of mine asked me, you know, do you get jerks? You get jerk clients. Like how many real assholes come for you, right? And I was like, I gotta tell you, I don't have any jerk clients because they filter out early. Because I'm the kind of person, you're probably already picking up on this, like I'm very high energy. I'm a big hearted person and I'm never not a big hearted person. Even at my most tired, my, mo my least energetic, I'm still like this, <laughs> right? I still care this much. I'll still cry over a job posting, even if I'm probably more so because I'm exhausted, but that's a different conversation, right? Yeah. Like, because I care that much because I know who's on the other side of this. And as recruiters, like, if you learn nothing else today, if you take nothing else out of this, like your big heart energy, that's what I call it, like, that matters. That will always stand out. That's your special thing. Don't best in class to just be the marching orders because the march isn't how you build a business it's not how you build a reputation it's not how you build a relationship amazing i have like written two pages of notes already <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Mm, awesome. Okay. And so how do you see that working for uh, recruiters on the ground for this yeah. audience? Like what, how, yeah. I truly believe that every recruiter should one, understand that voice. And you understand that more and more as you do great hiring manager intake. Mm. So hiring manager intake is not just getting a copy of the old job description and asking some questions about comp. It's actually asking questions that make the hiring manager tell you some really great stories. And what happens is as you're in that company for a while, and this is whether you're an agency recruiter that's supporting a company and trying to build up multiple reps, or you sit in house and you're kind of the traffic coordinator in a lot of jobs. I think what you'll notice is that you're doing what I do on a micro level because you're having conversations all the time. Intake is the difference between a good and great recruiter. It's also the difference between a good and great job posting, period, right? So what you're listening for is the phrases they say all the time. You gotta start using that language again when you write the job posting. You gotta use that language again when you're on the phone doing screening. You need to walk like a duck, sound like a duck, talk like, right? It's, you're a duck too. That's basically what I'm doing is like, creating my costume. <laughs> I know it's a weird analogy, but it works. Putting on my costume, right? And becoming like them, like their best people and really thinking like them. Because then I know their heart, I know their motivation and we can have a better conversation, right? That's, I hate to use the word culture fit, but I do think that language is a part of it. It's not traditional culture fit because I hate that crap and it's just full of bias, but it's, they have to talk like the people, right? They have to have the same motivation. Let me give you an example. I just did this project for a distribution center. So just so you guys know, don't know if anyone's aware of this, but distribution centers, there's a massive talent gap in that space. If you want to be the owner of something that will always have demand, Get into that space real quick, because right now that, that segment of talent, demand grew 43% in three years. If it doubles again, they actually expect there will be 3 million open recs and only 1 million will be filled. Wow. That's the projection. They've accepted that level of suckiness, <laughs> like, a, like a one third fill rate mm. on jobs. Time to get and some so, uh, job placement training yes. going, gosh. Exactly, right? But when we go in there, most people would project that role as $500 bonus for referring a friend, benefits, day one. You, you've all gotten that ad, right? The Amazon warehouse worker ad. Mm -hmm. But not at this company, that's not why people work there. They work there because they're proud of the brand and they're proud of the impact they have on the company. They don't see it as box filling. They see it as putting things people love into their hands. They said that over and over again. So if I were recruiting that role, I would ask them, what do you love about this job? And if they didn't have an answer for me, they're probably not gonna fit in on my group, right? Because these are people who run on energy, like me. Like, can you imagine someone who's like, oh, job postings are pretty average working with me? Like, it's not work. Mm -hmm. work, right? And I just think it's important that we understand that language because it does matter. Good point. And then it's almost like you're developing a shared language. Like, what is the nomenclature for this team, culture, company? Yeah. yeah. And that bleeds into your job posting too, right? I, I believe that if a recruiter can fundamentally understand what the hiring manager is saying to them, write something that sounds like the hiring manager, you have an advantage in the film. Right. Because you're going out there almost like a mirror of the hiring manager into the world instead of a separate component. And I think that's part of the problem, right? Other piece is that we're building relationships with the hiring manager. So we're building that trust up front. I think most people don't realize that writing a great job posting is actually your greatest advantage to making hiring managers trust and like you. Because you know what? They've read all the terrible job postings we have. I would not be here if most job postings did not suck. Oh, man. And hiring managers know they suck, but they have no idea where to start. 
if you walk in there as the expert, hi, my name's Katrina. I'm the expert on job postings and filling your job. If you can convey that expertise through incredible intake, quality job posting that drives actually qualified people, they'll remember you as the best recruiter they've ever worked with. Amazing, yeah. And it's, there's a lot of, they're used to not a lot of positive experiences. And so to be able to like even set yourself out marginally by having intake questions that get them thinking, huh, I haven't thought of that. That's a good question. And then and to deliver a job description that's their wording, but then with our recruiting expertise, like selling the opportunity and how to write a job description. And, and also job descriptions are really there to help candidates self-select into the opportunity. And you are creating better alignment for everybody because you're using the words of the hiring manager and it's it's resonating with the right people rather than overdoing it with the recruiting jargon. And that's yeah, awesome. That, yeah. And that gets to Benjamin's question about, you know, at creating a great job description has curb appeal. And so the thing that the only like filter I would say on that is it's curb appeal for the right person. I don't like to lead with perks and benefits because I don't want someone opting into perks and benefits. I want something opting into the job. Then I'll sell you the perks and benefits. Like I really hate the dating analogy for recruiting, but it works here, right? Like you don't need to know what kind of health insurance I have and how complicated my family relationships are in the very first conversation, right? Mm -hmm. like, like we can just do the surface level stuff and make sure that we're on the same page about the things that matter most in a first date. The job posting, the only point of a job posting is that someone walks away from it saying, yes, I can do the job or no, I cannot. So what I want to see instead of perks and benefits is why do people quit? We have a high volume, low retention role that you fill all the time. That should probably be your first sentence. Tell them why they would quit. I'm dead serious. Cause I long hours, low pay. <laughs> yes. No, I've written that posting, right? Like I wrote one today and what we did with it is we took all the reasons people quit and we created a section that says, when you're looking for a new job, we understand that you'll have a lot of questions. Here are a few we're asked all the time. Brilliant. What's the overtime like? And we spelled it out. What's the pay like? This is our range. What's the commute like? And literally the thing I put next to it was plug this address into Google maps. That's part of the job because there was no experience required. Great. What are we going to write about? And I can tell you right now, making stuff up puts you at a disadvantage, right? And it puts diverse people at a disadvantage, right? So I actually, and I think this is what brought us together for our first call, Allison, is that I just did a hundred year old research study. I looked at job postings. I looked at the very first job postings ever recorded. Then I looked at job postings from 100 years ago. Then I compared them to job postings of today. Because I believe that there's actually bias in our structure, not necessarily the language. I think there are plenty of tools. So if you type in free gender decoder, you can get a cheap text video. And I saw that question come in about the tool. Yeah, so free gender decoder. That's where I would start. And, but my perspective, as far as that tool, is that tool comes last. To create a job posting that attracts people from all backgrounds, I prefer that we remove traditional barriers versus trying to follow some rule list and basically creating a like for veterans chart and a for, for people of color and a for gay, the LGBT community chart. Like, I don't want to go there. What I want you to do and what I ultimately did, right, by looking at those hundred year old job postings and seeing which tactics we're still using. I was able to understand how our format, the format that everyone uses on their jobs is actually bringing the bias. It's the template and the structure of how we deliver information right now that's creating bias because psychologically we read it, people in the categories, all the categories I just listed, we read it and assume we need to be 100% qualified. And we don't apply because we're not 100% qualified by their metrics. However, what I encourage people to do is to create clarity. Clarity removes barriers. If I 100% understand the job A to Z, 
That's how we create diverse pipelines. We remove barriers for those people. We make things explicit. We communicate better. We don't follow some checklist. Amazing. Tell me more. I mean, how does, so what do you, what do you think? So what does, what, well, I'm just like envisioning the structure you have your intro paragraph and you have like responsibilities and you have like experience. That's like the fundamentals, right? And that's, it's been that way for like a hundred years. Yep. So I say <laughs> trash that entire thing. Okay. Stay interesting. Warm. Tell us more. Do not start with your copy and paste finger. Do not start with the old job posting open. None of that. Okay. Green that's field. step one. Fresh. Start with a blank piece of paper. Great. Paragraph one is called a job pitch. There are three elements that go into a job pitch. First sentence, the impact of the role. As a blank, you will help blank do blank by blank. Okay, and I know okay. that sounds like a lot of blanks. Do it again. As what a is job title. Okay. What's the impact of that role? That's what goes next. Example, the one I literally just got off a coaching session, like not even five minutes ago, and I rewrote a job posting for an electrical panel technician. Yeah, that boring. I wrote a, a temperature taker last week. Ask me about that one. Okay, first sentence, impact. As our electrical panel technician, you will create the panels that drive our revenue. We cannot bill without you. That's the impact of that person because they're building the product that this company sells. If it were customer service, let me go to a more generic version. Um, as our customer service rep, you will help our customers make financial decisions so they can uh, you know, retire on time. As our software engineer, you will build the database that is the foundation of our tech offering. You'll help customers get their groceries on time. Right? We can go way practical or we can get really specific, but it's the impact. This is what you do. Second sentence, every day you will. Give me three things. Remember, they're opting into this job. If there's something they do every single day that they hate, and you list it right here, they might say no. <laughs> That's an ideal scenario. Yes. Every day you will. Three things. Last sentence, to thrive in this role, you must. So I want to be really clear about that. To thrive in this role, you must. It is not have a college degree unless they are a doctor, a lawyer, or someone who must have a license in order to complete their job. That ain't it. You must have experience building a complicated database using this code base that delivers blah, blah, blah. You get these requirements all the time, but we aren't explicit with candidates. You must. These are the bottom line. No, I joke. A hiring manager would crumble up the resume and Kobe it into the trash if it did not have this thing. It's that explicit. That's paragraph one. It's a job pitch. If they read nothing else, they should be able to say yes or no to the job in that paragraph. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Paragraph two, slap the company about us and there. Don't work too hard. Easy. Copy and paste. So three, this is a section of the bullets. You're capping yourself at seven. I want the description. So Allison just listed some of the traditional requirements, this, that. No, not anymore. What you write is why this list exists. So I just gave you the example for my electrical panel. Uh, we wrote, here are the questions. People who look for new jobs have a lot of questions. Here are the questions we're asked most often. That is actually the first time I've ever used that, which I was like, that's really smart. I should be using that for everything. But let me give you more of my traditional one. Uh, here's what you can expect in a typical day. Here's what we're looking for. That's my favorite. How often have you read a job posting that was like, here's what I want? <laughs> Seems so freaking obvious to me. Like, why wouldn't I tell you what I'm looking for? Like, duh. That's like going into Lowe's and they're like, do you need help? No, I'll look for that screw by myself for the next two and a half hours because it's at and if you, you're a homeowner, you understand the joke I'm trying to make. <laughs> you will never see another right. person to help you again. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> right? Be explicit. Why does the list exist? Why? Yeah, Why you'd does mentioned, the list exist? You'd mentioned two things in the paragraph three. Here's what you can expect from your typical day. Or what was the second one? Um, here's what we're looking for. Okay. Or um, 
what would that look like? Here's what we're looking for. So like the ability yeah. to lift boxes for 45, four hours at a time or like. Yeah, let me give a really technical example since you're all tech recruiters. Yes, please. Here's what we're looking for. You have built a database using Tableau that connects millions of data points, period. <laughs> uh, let's go up a level. So manager, you've managed a team of five or more and created the project roadmap that delivered XYZ on time. You've worked with a complete 100% remote team to manage three code bases or more. You can work across four codes, this, 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 and this, right? Do you see how explicit my stuff is? There's no years of experience here because that's one of the traditional biases that, do you know a hundred years ago they were still writing job posts exactly like they write them today? Mm. So I've banned years of experience, they're out. Because they mean something to us. Like, let's say Noel and I worked at the same company. If we used the same tool and I'm a marketer and she's a recruiter, we have two different experiences, but we could both say we have two years of Salesforce experience, right? So that's why years of experience is now banned. No more of that. Be explicit. Focus How, on why, what. Okay. How, you should why? be able to imagine it. Four years of experience. Does that pop any pictures in your head? <laughs> no. <laughs> right? No. Built a grocery app. I get well, it's focused on accomplishments. Ooh. So it helps uh, negate the imposter syndrome. And it's like, oh, I can do that. I've done that. Yes. And so this is reframing that responsibility section. That's more from the employer's perspective and sort of a push thing. And now it's more like visualize yourself here. Do yes. these things resonate? Yeah. <laughs> Apply. Here's what I know you. Yes. That's another favorite, especially on tech. In the next six months, you'll know you were successful if. Amazing. List out those projects that the hiring manager is just obsessing over. The metaphor that I like to think about is a plate. Especially on highly technical roles, this really works. So we don't hire anyone willy-nilly. Okay? We're not just like, you know, wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm gonna hire someone. Hire them to take something off of this plate, put it onto a new plate, right? In theory. Tell the person what's on your plate that's coming off of your plate. They get really specific all of a sudden. Because it's, it's almost like a, you know, a Trello task list all of a sudden. And it's not some weird metaphorical where they're like, I need a software engineer. You're like, I need a little more detail. <laughs> like, that's a lot of people with a lot of different experiences. Right. And the term software developer can mean so many things also, right? Just like a Java developers, you know, it's actually I like coming back to how you started we assume there's so much assumption in words and yes. it is so different and to learn how to say and what does what does java development mean to you <laughs> like the mm -hmm. idea of actually let's get more granular let's acknowledge that a pastry is not a pastry is a pastry right yes yeah and, and really contextualizing success too so it's not just how do you see this, but so I love to use this phrase because it just makes hiring managers laugh and give you a little bit of a smile, but I'll ask like, all right, if I hired the best person ever, you're sending me Christmas gifts, you're sending me cookies, you sent me an Amazon gift card because you are so excited about this person. What's happening in six months that's not happening right now? Dang, yeah. All of a sudden they get real specific and you get a grin, <laughs> right? They're happy. They get it. They get what, and I think my favorite part, and you'll experience this as you practice the hiring manager intake, which by the way, I keep, I give away a free copy of mine. So if you go to three years media under the resources, my free, my hiring manager intake is right there. Awesome. And, and so what happens is that the hiring manager starts to relax a little right? Because they feel like they're working with an expert. And the other, like the best thing I could hear and people, people are like, oh, they're BSing you, but you'll hear it in their voice if they are or not. 
is that they say like, that's a really good question. I just never thought of it that way. That's a bigger compliment, honestly. Yes. <laughs> that's when you've reached expertise, truly. Because you're, they're saying like, I trust you because I know you're doing it different. And I know it should be different. They've read the same postings you have. They know how bad it is. Oh yeah, it's, will you put your website in the, will you put it in the yeah. chat? Yeah. Of course. That is, I mean, and that's the whole thing about moving into creating a more equitable job app recruiting process is helping to rethink and kind of question literally every chain in our workflow. And it's from the hiring manager conversation to how we translate that to the job descriptions, to how we even think about our interview processes, to talking about our benefits and our career page. And I, this was like a really good digest around specifically the hiring manager into job description. And just with the cornerstone orientation of perspective and the candidate and not just us pushing old standards yeah. out. Yeah. Like if a job, if a hiring manager starts to read the job description to you or sends you that as step one, tell them to stop. Mm. Okay. As the owner of this, your what I want to see from you in that moment is when you say, stop, stop, stop. I want you to imagine success and imagine the work. I'll take care of the job. I have the, co I have a copy of that. We're good. Right. Really they don't okay want to do it. Stop. Honestly, you know, they do not want to be doing the job descriptions. None of us want the hiring manager to be doing no. the job descriptions. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Good point. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, and you guys opened up to questions. I'm sure there's like a million nodes, even from this round. And I'm not even trying to Stop. If you have more to go, Katrina, because I also think that, like five pages in, I'm like, I'll take everything you've got. And also, if anyone has questions, clearly put them into the chat. Um, ah, okay, great. Oh. Any other I thoughts from, yeah, I saying. don't mean to like, yeah, force oh. a, a measure there, but um Okay, so then is there with the, the, so there's three paragraphs. Let's just sort of like digest this um, job description translation. I really am liking this. So you're seeing three main paragraphs and it's in order of importance. So number one, it is the pitch and it is starting with the impact of the role. And so it really gets them feeling like I am accomplishing this job. And then it's like, okay, well, tell me more about the company and then tell me more about what I need to do to be that person accomplishing this awesome job. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> the three paragraphs? Yep, exactly. And the last paragraph that I forgot to mention is your EEO, right? Oh, oh right, of course. Want. Brilliant. Yes. And Noelle actually brought up a really good point saying like the ATSs are not built for this. And so what I tell people who are in that scenario, so a lot of times that's clearance job, government, if you work in any highly regulated industry, there's usually sections and you have to like plug in a number and then it auto populates and you can't, you know, you're only supposed to touch one box. So what I tell people is create subheadings. So if you know it's always gonna say requirements and you're not going for that battle, I understand. I don't go for it either. I'll put my little subheading, here's what we're looking for, under requirements, because that's the human version of what requirements means. That's kind of the, always the test is like, what, what does that mean? What, are, what does it mean to them? What do they expect to get out of this? I'll always put that in. Um, and then, I love the question about passive candidates because you're, you nailed it. Writing for recruiting is so, it's, it's everything we do. That's why I couldn't believe that I was the only person who does this. Like, how? Why? <laughs> Come on, people. Okay, so passive candidates. Are we talking one to one, one to 10, one to a database or a small group? More marketing to them. I love it. Okay. So the first thing I say is go to people who have the job and then ask them, what app do you open first in the morning? I promise this has a point. What app do you open first in the morning? Then I ask them, when you're scrolling, what catches your eye? So 
with those two pieces of information, I use that to build my passive candidate messaging. So that's how I do the marketing. I know they use Facebook and they love ads. So I use obnoxious colors, <laughs> numbers, and, a and I use Facebook instead of text or email or whatever everyone else told me to do. Right? Because it's for them. Right? The other thing I would tell you as far as these is I really like hyper segmentation tools. So the one I used to use just got removed, but someone else told me about a tool called Source Whale yesterday that'll let you do this. And what you can do is take a big database of passives and go, I want all the people who live in Detroit. Then I want all the people who live in Detroit and have this word on their resume. And I want to send them this email. The reason I like that is that actually when I first started out, I helped a recruiter rewrite his automation stream for top four accountants. And we kind of worked through some of those, those things. And we ended up writing a really good automation email. That, and it was for people who had been at their job more than three years. And the subject line said, uh, your new job is dot, dot, dot. Ready? And the first sentence was, well, if you're clicking on an email like this, you might want a new job. Oh, there you go. I like that. They got 8 P. I mean, he was getting immediate responses within 30 minutes from top four accountants. Amazing. Let's go straight right? to it. Right. <laughs> Psychology. We're thinking, cause that's my whole thing is I was going, all right, if I was a consultant in accounting at a top four accounting firm, what's my life like, right? I'm probably on some kind of career path. I have to wear suits a lot. Like, ah, uh, there's something. If I'm opening an email like this, there's a reason why I don't like my job. So why don't we just open it up? Your new job is. And see what they, if they click on it, they want something new. I use this actually on my own website even. So I include Calendly. I actually embed a copy of my Calendly on the company website because I want sales conversations. I don't want them to fill out a form and then book a meeting with me. This applies to recruiting too. Think about it. Do you want somebody filling out a form and then you have to play tag from there or do you want them to just book a meeting? So what I did is I created one that says, let's work together, right? That says, I'm open to changing my, I'm, I'm, I want to work with you. You already made a commitment by booking something that's called let's work together instead of let's talk. That what little are... bit of psychological nuance makes such a difference. Because again, we got to think about them. What's for them? Um, I experienced a challenge with some hiring manager and getting them to open up more about the job and expectations. That's from Benjamin. Hiring manager intake, my friend. I'm telling you, if you ask the questions that I have in there and get that really detailed and always push, push, push. Okay, so if they say, I need four years of job up, this is the, que the follow-up question for you, Benjamin. Okay, can you tell me what someone knows at four years that they do not know at three? Boom. By the way, that's, that's not actually a real question. Like, you don't, there's not a universal answer to that, but there is intel there that you need. What do you know at four that you do not know at three? That will get you your answer. And frankly, I was like, if you just have that, because then it reframes uh, it into your ability of what you can do, which is what you're trying to get them to say. Yes. All brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Or my other favorite, what are they doing now to prepare them for this role? Do they have the exact same job right now? Or is this a level up for them? Are you looking for a manager with a lot of potential to come into this director role? Or are you looking for this to be a parallel move? Um, Alicia, great question. Do I feel it's a disadvantage when recruiters are not part of the intake? 100%. Because that's the moment two things happen during intake. Number one, your first impression on the hiring manager. And if you're some ghost that just exists in the periphery until the moment you bring candidates, there's no trust. None. So I guess like, 
my company has a very hybrid approach with recruiting. We like, you know, I'm an internal recruiter for my company, but we basically supply um, developers and engineers to clients. So yeah. it's kind of like a hybrid staffing and also internal recruiting position. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really a different department that does that intake. And it's something that this is my first recruiting role. So I've never actually yeah. seen the full life cycle process. I feel like me personally, since I've never done it before, I'm missing out on so much by not being able to be part of it because, you know, I, I feel like this other yeah. department is very much an intermediary between the recruiters and, and our clients, which is mm -hmm. fine. But I feel like because it's in different departments, it's not working seamlessly when it could. Yes. So you can totally be like, I saw this presentation about jobs and she recommends. So that would be step one. Cause they're always looking for an expert to tell them what's right, which don't even get me started on that. Especially know. <laughs> when yeah. I'm just like, it's just right. It's common sense. Like, okay. So option two is you can ask them to start recording and transcribing intakes. Okay. So that's like a good hybrid step where maybe they don't want to invite you to the meetings. They're doing their sales schmoozing or whatever the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. But I do think that you could say like, I think it would be beneficial to everyone on this team if we had a database of intake conversation. Because there's two benefits to that. And it's not just about the recruiter being better. One, it creates a recorded baseline of expectation. Yeah. Exactly, right? So the hiring manager can't come back and be like, well, I actually wanted six years, not seven. Right. Right. Or I really wanted, no, we have an intake right here. I copy, I quoted you verbatim. You said this. Are you kidding me? Right. It creates accountability there Two, it creates content for everyone to use. So if someone's marketing this job, they can go to the intake and pull quotes. If someone's rewriting the job post, mm. right. If they're talking to candidates and where they want to confirm that language piece, we need the language verbatim. I always tell people, you know, I'm a writer. My excuse for recording is I'm a writer. If I write it down, it's mine, not yours. <laughs> right? So I tell them I record and transcribe to make sure that I say it the way you say it, not the way I want to say it. Okay. I think there's a ton of benefits and you can look at the surface, the sides, but every it's of like multifaceted benefits to have that piece of content. Right. And that's something that I've definitely, um, I don't want to say frustrated, but something that I feel is like a huge knowledge gap in my learning as a recruiter is because I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I know that these are the skills, these are the requirements that we're looking for, but it It's, okay, last thing, because I, I get like get on a soapbox about this one, but like, I think that people believe that they need a lot of inputs to create great content. And the reality is like, no, I need one great input. And then I need a lot of people to all have that input. That's how you create great content. It's not about having like, Again, I, I truly don't think it's even about having a hundred people in the intake meeting. It's like, but you have to create assets from that and distribute it to everyone. It can't just be your like secret intel and you're the powers that be because that create, I mean, that's almost a domino issue to me. Every single person starts having issues because one person didn't do an intake well. And so much, like, it is the head of the, yes. Yeah. Oh, so just, there we okay. go. <laughs> Well, and it's more like also, I like the idea of seeing the intake as the head of the snake, you know, uh, kind of what you're, if you don't have a good at top, it's everything downhill. And then, but if with your resource that you've shared with us, it would be great if we can share that at least if we can't be there to be like, can you at least make sure to cover these three to five questions to help me do my job so I help you better? Um, yes. Yeah. Or you'd be like, you know, I met somebody who's an expert in job post writing and they gave me this free hire for intake. Maybe we should break that up. That's it. And what do you think about adding in the question around like with the hiring manager in terms of you mentioned moving goalposts and things like what makes a yes? What do you what is going to be a yes on this candidate? 
Um, do, you, do you ask that question in the intake or do you see a value in adding that? I, the question I ask is what are your 100% deal breaker requirements? Oh, great way I, to put it. Yep. You, okay. So the funny way that I'll say it, and this is optional, but I'll go, you'd laugh in my face if this resume didn't have this. Again, we're trying to build rapport. And that, that's really why, Alicia, I want you in those hiring manager intakes is because that builds trust. So when I come back, they're like, yes. Like, do you know how often my job posts get edited? Rarely. If anything, it's one bullet that they're kind of like, well, I prefer you say it that way. And I'm like, you didn't need to call me to mark that. You just wrote it. We'll copy and paste it in there, right? Like, they, they know. And if they see themselves in that post and they see that you really listened to them, they'll trust you. When you come out from left field and you're like, hi, nice to meet you. Here's four candidates. They're like, who are you? And why should I trust you? Right? That's not where I want to start. Awesome. Katrina, I have like, eight pages of notes in my notebook. Um, I am digesting all of this. This has been so, so valuable. Um, look, looking forward to trying, getting your download from your website. So it's threeearsmedia.com and then she has a resources tab. So go there. I'm sure you have more than just the intake questions, yeah. but. I have a workbook that will walk you through job posting A to Z. Awesome. And then that hiring manager intake is just a quick grab for that template. Mm. Great. And what, what would you like to, what would you like to be a key takeaway for the group or maybe actually two things? How, what, what's the best way to stay in touch with you? Follow you on Twitter, LinkedIn, like what's the best way to, to keep in touch or get your posts? Well, on a positive, I am the only Katrina Kibben in the world, which okay. people have that to say. Congratulations. So if you spell my name right, you'll find me. Okay. Uh, and you, you pick your preference, right? So I think the, the content that I'm probably the most proud of, and I'll just tell you point blank, I do a letter every week and it's about the human side of recruiting. It's about humanity and who we are for people. Uh, and that's at newsletter.threeearsmedia.com. Um, but all the tra I got all the traditional stuff, right? I got a weekly blog, a resource center, all that junk. I just, I don't like marketing myself. I think if you really want to hear from me and how I think, that letter is where you're going to get that. Excellent. Awesome. And if you were to leave one kernel or golden nugget for everybody um, to, to cap off this amazing session together, what, what would you share with us? Yeah. You write for people, not about work. Awesome. I get a lot of pushback that job postings don't matter. I think that's pretty bold to say to somebody like me who's literally built an entire company on job postings, but people will say whatever the hell they want to me. And the thing I always tell them is that a great job posting isn't about candidate behavior. It's not about if they read it or not, if this kind of candidate doesn't even look at it. I don't care. A job posting is about who I want to be for them, who I want to be to them. I want to show them that I'm empathetic, that I'm transparent, that I'm considerate. Because for me, I will never forget what it feels like to be a job seeker. And that is my filter. That's my empathy. And if you remember what it feels like to be a job seeker, you'd never treat people like that either. So write for people, not about work. Because here's, I just want to add one thing to that. Like when you decide to search for a job, you've admitted you're not happy with your life. When you get brave enough to say, I'll change everything. I'll change my commute, my benefits, my fill in the blank, all that stuff. When you are brave enough to accept that, something's not going right for you in your soul, your mind. I don't know where that is. Be considerate of that moment, of their heart, of what must have happened to them to get them to the point where they decided they were willing to change everything for you. Write a great job posting for that person, for their heart. Powerful. Thank you. Gosh, goosebumps. That is a good I mean, reminder. Who cares about job more than me? No. I mean, amazing. <laughs> amazing. I know, yes, you are top ticket. I'm looking forward to more with you. This is awesome. I want to thank you from everyone in the group. I know we, we had 
a lot of engagement and you know there's more uh, to come everybody so please find Katrina connect with her send her an email as a thank you um, Thank you so much for letting us record this too so we can share it with the world because this is just true wisdom and as we build and grow the new paradigm of talent and recruiting and inclusion and a bigger tent in all industries it's by changing going from the head which is what has been dominant to the heart and a more of a pull energy and I, this is putting the human into it. This is awesome. And that we do have a lot of power in our words. And the more we can spend up front that hour on the job description, it'll make everything else faster downstream. And oh man, we could do a whole day session on this, but Katrina, Kevin, three year, years media. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I always tell people, if you've gone through one session with me, we're all friends here. So <laughs> yes. just send me a quick email and be like, I know you from this. Can you help me with that? And the answer is yes. Great. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And um, I'm Allison Daly from Recruiting Innovation. And this was part of the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant Leadership Series. Thanks for being our guest and our great instructor today. Thank, thank you, you Katrina. Yay. This is Sam. Yeah. I'm looking forward to connecting with you too. And you're Good. so right. I, thank I you so help. much. Yay. Thank Excellent. <laughs> Everyone's it. vibing. Our energy. I can feel That's it. What, can That's feel what it, it is. Strong all back. Day. Thank Strong you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Thanks.